Hello, everyone, and welcome to our Twitter space today. My name is Stephen Smith, and I'm the head of protocol at Tools for Humanity. Also do kind of a couple of other things, um, but the important thing is TFH is a contributor to the WorldCoin project. We're going to have a great conversation today. So today we're going to be talking about, about the org specifically and about two things recently. One is a security audit report that, just re that was just released, as well as the Orb software that was just open source today. Now, we've got several great guests with us on the space today who have been heavily involved with both these initiatives. And with me today are Dan Gersovic and Ryan Butler from the TFH Orb software team. Dan, would you like to introduce yourself first? Hey, everyone. I'm Dan. I, I lead the Orb software team at Tools for Humanity. I've been at it for three years now. and yeah, as Stephen mentioned, uh, others on the team are joining us today, some as speakers, some in the audience, and excited to talk about the orb and answer your questions. All right. Very good, Dan. And Ryan, how about you? You want to give us a, a brief intro? Yeah, I'm Ryan. I'm also one of the software engineers at Tools for Humanity. I've been working on the orb for about nine months. So I'm one of the newer contributors. And I was one of the people working on specifically the open sourcing and all the engineering effort related to that. Yeah, and, and Dan and Ryan have both been heavily involved in this. And Ryan, I know, I just, you know, watching the different Slack channels, Ryan's been so heavily involved in the process of, of open sourcing the software and the announcement today. And we also have uh, Philip Sippel from the WorldCoin Foundation. And Philip, do you want to say a few words, introduce yourself? Sure. Yeah, so Philip, so part of founding teams are there from the very beginning, like four years now, now part of the foundation and overseeing a lot of the entering as a whole of the whole worker project and specifically working on the, on everything protocol related. And yeah, I'm very excited to be here. I think I personally promised so many people over the last years that the orb will be open source and especially the software. So very happy that it's finally happening. All right. Very good. Yeah. So it's going to be a great conversation, but before we get going, just a, a little bit of quick housekeeping. We always try to leave time at the end of the space to get any audience questions. So anything you, you might have about the ORB uh, software or the security audits, just drop those in the thread associated with the space at any point in time. And then, you know, roughly in the next 30, 35 minutes, we'll start getting to some of those. Okay, let's jump right in. So let's first talk about the, the ORB security audit uh, that, was, uh, that we, we put on a blog post about today. But to do this, you know, I always like to back up and, and do a little bit of level set. Because someone, some people might be joining who are not quite as familiar with the orb and its role in the project as obviously some of the people on the team here or others that are maybe more familiar with WorldCoin. But so let's just kind of set the stage and we'll talk about what the orb is first and then we can talk about the, the audits and the open sourcing. So Philip, do you, do you mind like setting the stage for us? Just kind of talk about the role the orb plays in, in kind of the overall WorldCoin project? Sure. Yeah, so I guess the orb is to some extent probably the most famous part of the overall system, mostly because of its looks, uh, as it's being this shiny sphere. But it's actually also one of the more important parts of the whole protocol and the whole system because it is fundamentally the part of the system that determines two things very importantly. So one is that you're actually a unique, unique human. So for that purpose, the orb is pretty much taking an image of the colorful uh, uh, patterns in your eyes. So they are visible usually from the outside. Um, um, the, the patterns that you usually see and that are colored, um, they add up to a very unique code that we call iris code. And this is ultimately the thing that determines whether you have um, signed up before or used the org before. But the second part of the thing that the org does is very importantly, it also needs to determine that you are actually a human and it's not just a printout, for example. And this is the, the part that verifies humanness, which is done uh, only local on the orb through various sensors, looking at different characteristics of a human face. And yeah, so that's what the orb does in a nutshell. How it ties into the rest of the protocol is that the orb, as I said, produces this iris code. With this, it's actually not enough for the orb alone to determine uniqueness that has to be sent to a part of the system, which is determining the uniqueness over all of those iris codes. And then ultimately this whitelists a public key, which the user has on its own self-custodially control over. 
and is part of right now the, the wallet or world app in the current uh, ecosystem and is used then later to produce reality proofs and ultimately you only have to use the orb once to enroll and later you only use um, wallet of your choice or world app uh, to produce these reality proofs to prove to other applications that you are human. All right. Very good. Yeah. So I would definitely agree that probably the orb is the most um, fundamentally recognizable part of the project and the protocol. A uh, bright, shiny sphere. Yeah. Is, is a great way to put it. So thanks a lot for that, Phil. So now we know what the, the orb is and the role that it plays in the protocol. I want to talk quickly about, you know, why audits are important in general and for the WorldCoin project specifically and what the results of the orb security audit showed about its claims. So the World Plain project itself is founded on a commitment to privacy and security. And we work with a number of audit firms uh, and we audit basically the entire part of the stack. Cryptography, blockchain related components, both on-chain and off-chain, uh, include smart contracts, of course. But then other parts of the stack as well, like our infrastructure, um, our backend componentry. And in this case, we're talking about the actual software that runs on the ORP, which Dan was, was heavily involved in. Um, for this particular for this particular audit, we chose a firm called Trail of Bits, which is an incredibly well-respected firm. I had used Trail of Bits previously when I worked on the Zcash project. So it's really great to work with them again and get them involved um, in our project. But Dan, um, can you tell us, you know, about the ORB security audit process, like what it consisted of and go over some of the results for us? Sure. It actually all started, I think, uh, as an idea from Sat, who's in the audience today, or at least he's the first one that mentioned it to me. And it was the idea that the claims that we make about the privacy on the device, for example, that the images on the device don't leave the device, except for this iris code, which you already mentioned, and all the details around how that's handled securely, those specific claims could be checked by a third party to go hand in hand with open sourcing, which we'll talk about later. And so we put together a set of these claims. We worked with Frail Bits to refine them, make sure they were really clear. And they did an audit of those specific claims and all of the security related components around them to make sure that we are upholding on the engineering side to these specific privacy guarantees. Very good. Yes. And, um, you know, I mean, that, that's a great summary. This is a, you know, was an interesting audit to me. Like most audits are basically security, what, what I would call security assessments, where you kind of provide an audit vendor. Um, access to a GitHub repo and they maybe architectural diagrams or flows and they go through it and uh, look at it line by line. Um, in this case, in addition to, you know, that type of thing, um, there were the claims as Dan mentioned, like, you know, here are the claims we make about the orb and Trello bits kind of, you know, validated against those claims. We've got it. We just put, again, we put the blog post up today. All that can be found at worldcoin.org slash blog. And um, it goes into detail about the different claims and um, a summary of uh, the findings. And then there's also a link out to the actual Trail of Bits report, if anyone's interested in taking a look at that in more detail. Yeah. So then we'll kind of move on. We're going to move into talking about open source in a minute. But just again, a reminder about any questions that you might have. Just put those in the Twitter thread and we'll do our best to get to get to those toward the end. Okay, so now we're going to pivot to another announcement we made today, which was about open source, which is that the WorldCoin Foundation, which controls all the important IP of the WorldCoin project, has open sourced the core component of the Orb software. Now, a number of parts of our tech stack are already open source, primarily those around the protocol, which, as I mentioned earlier, includes things like cryptography and off-chain and on-chain components related to the protocol. And I remember having a conversation sometime back, a number of us, with Balaji Srinivasan, about the, the importance of open source and how it plays a critical role in the decentralization process. Uh, the announcement and all the work that has gone into making it possible to do this is an incredibly important step in the history of the project, you could argue. Now, Dan, I know you and Ryan have been working on this for an incredibly long time, um, but can you kind of walk us through today's announcement specifically, like what's been open source and what does it mean for the, the broader WorldCoin community? Sure. Uh, I'm happy to give an overview and then maybe pull in Ryan uh, for some specific details. As you mentioned, of course, it provides transparency and additional security along uh, with the audits that we already discussed. And finally, it's a way of giving back. Uh, a lot of, uh, almost all of these components are written in Rust and some of the things that we had to develop internally 
for example, a specific kind of asynchronous agent framework with message passing or a, an efficient way of communicating between Python and Rust can be reused by other projects. And so we're excited to have those out there and not just show people what we've done, but help them avoid redoing that work. So specifically today, the main component is called Orb Core. We named it that because it's the core process that runs on the device. And it's, it does all the things you think of when you think of what the Orb has to do. So it's processing the camera streams, communicating with the backend, handling a lot of the security interfaces. The Orb runs many neural networks and Orb Core is responsible for interfacing with those networks. And everything I just described is part of this open source release of Orb Core. Enumerate some of the other projects that we open source today and then have a section at the end for future work, things that aren't included in this first wave, but will be soon. On top of Orb Core, we open sourced uh, several additional components. Uh, most interesting maybe to talk about now is the microcontroller firmware. So the Orb has a main processor where Orb Core runs, but it also has two um, separate microcontrollers, which handle in one case, real-time controls of the imaging system, uh, some health related uh, tasks and powering up the device. And there's a separate microcontroller that handles things like tamper detection and interfacing with the secure element. Uh, in today's announcement, in today's open source release, the microcontroller code for everything related to the real-time controls, the health of the device and powering the system, which we call the main microcontroller, was released. And so that's a large C code base. It's on a real-time operating system called Zephyr, which is itself open source. And along with Orb Core, in combination with Orb Core, it provides the entire stack for doing a sign-up on the device. Uh, modulo some components we can talk about now, which are related to broad checks. As Philip mentioned, the device does a uniqueness step, but it also does uh, humanness checks. And some of these components that we use for the humanness checks involve machine learning libraries that were developed in house. And those specific libraries, namely the weights for those neural networks, we consider too sensitive to open source at this time. And so those have been removed from Orb Core. And some of our future work is to make the interfaces to those networks much more explicit. And a topic I find really interesting is how we can have such fraud related closed source components still be trustless to the maximum degree possible. And one of the steps we've already taken in that direction is the use of sandboxes or jails. This is described in the uh, open sourcing blog post today, and the code for them is part of the open source code. But effectively, you can think of it as a container or a wrapper around the closed source components, which restricts the system access that they have. So a neural network that processes an image of the eye or face for a fraud check can be proven to not be able to write to BISC, not be able to upload over the network, et cetera. Ryan, is there anything else you wanted to touch on that I didn't mention? Yeah. Um, in addition to the firmware and the main process that runs in the orb, there's also the orb secure element repository, which is responsible for the communication with the secure element from the main CPU. And uh, in addition, there's also a number of supplementary services and libraries inside of the Orb software repo, which also acts as a convenient place to link into everything else, including Orb Core and the firmware. In particular, one of the most interesting ones, for example, if you want a very easy place to look at as a you know, with a small surface area to kind of get your feet wet in the code would be the orbit test binary. This is basically a process that runs on the machine and is responsible for talking to the secure element on the orb to come up with a token necessary to talk to the backend. And that's how the backend understands that this is an actual genuine orb, something that the foundation has allow listed as an orb capable of doing signups. And there's a number of other software components which are very interesting to look at. And we can, we have a nice video that kind of goes over orb core in particular, since that one's the largest binary, um, but there's plenty of documentation 
throughout the Orb software repository that explains what these different software components do. Thanks, Ryan. I'll also highlight some things that are coming up. So the blog post describes Orb OS, which is our custom Linux-based operating system that was designed by Tools for Humanity specifically for the Orb. It's optimized for security. It also has a design which supports reproducibility, and this is helpful for a verifiability work stream, which is described both in the blog post and the white paper. We'd like to design the Orb in a way where third parties or the public could in the future check that an Orb is running the specific open source software that we've published. And um, Orb OS was designed with that in mind. Additionally, we have a custom update system for the Orb. So we remotely update devices to later versions of the software. And that custom system will be open sourced in a future wave. Finally, along the lines of what Ryan just described with the secure element, we additionally have custom applets, which are running in the trusted execution environment on the Jetson. These are some of the most security critical parts of the code and are undergoing a second audit right now by a separate firm. After that, we intend to open source these applets as well. And finally, as I already mentioned, the parts of Orb Core that interface with the fraud checks need to be improved to make a more explicit interface to those checks. And the software uh, defined jails or sandboxes I described are also undergoing improvement. And we expect that in the near future, a version of Orb Core with these explicit interfaces and explicit jails will be open source as well. Yeah, one of the things that's really interesting from the engineering side is how do we take what has been a closed source code base for a few years now and transition it into something that we can develop in the open? One of the things that I'm really excited about is that in certain repositories, for example, in the firmware and in org software, we can actually open PRs directly against the main branch directly in the public view so that really anyone can see what we're doing and they know that what we're developing is publicly available, right? And so in an ideal world, we want all of the software that isn't, you know, explicitly kept private for security reasons to be developed directly in the open. And so one of the main goals uh, in our team is to transition to that style of development and uh, over time continue to improve, like Dan said, the sandboxing of these closed source components so that anyone looking at that code knows that these things are isolated and the permissions that they have are very limited. So even if you can't see the code for those parts, you know that it is not like sending images over the internet or something. Thanks, Ryan. But yeah, so a, a couple of things to point out again, just reference in our blog, rollpoint.org slash blog, the, the articles written there, all the links to the repos are in there. And when we talk about open sourcing the, the Orb software, if I, if I count it correctly, we're talking about 12 different repos here. And so it's just, a, it's just a massive amount of code, massive amount of, of work. And if you're familiar with GitHub, you know that GitHub repos typically have a readme in them. So the readmes are also very informative as well. So yeah, so I'd encourage everyone to go, to go check that out. So yeah, as Dan mentioned, we're going to get to, to Q&A in just a minute. So if you don't have a question in and you do have one, please get that in because we'll get to it pretty quick. But before we kind of get to that, yeah, and, and again, thanks so much, Dan and Ryan, for, for being with us today, but also for the incredibly hard work on the audits and the open sourcing and everything. So, um, but I do want to kind of just, you know, pause for a minute, just kind of maybe look ahead. I always like take two or three minutes and just kind of talk about something that might be coming up, others might be interested in. And so, Philip, this was a really big announcement from the foundation today. I was just wondering if you might be able to talk about some of the other things that are in pipeline for the foundation, anything you just want to highlight on the, on the space today? Yeah, I think um, as we also announced a few weeks back, Wave Zero, uh, we'll also start an, another wave of grants very soon. So the Wave 1, Wave Zero was around 28 teams that we were very closely together with. And yeah, so I think that's probably the major announcement on that side, a new wave coming soon. And yeah, very keen on any kind of projects that touch either protocol or anything else. So yeah, I think that's it. Okay. Excellent. Yeah. And all this kind of maps to, again, the, her blog is super informative. We have what we call a tech tree and it identifies like different parts of the tech stack. And, and then we had the wave zero grants that Philip mentioned and wave one coming up, but 
basically all the grant opportunities kind of map to that tech tree. And then of course the orb software is a huge part of the tech tree. So it just by open sourcing, it encourages other people to, to get involved in many other different areas of the tech tree. Um, yeah, so thanks, thanks for that. So let's move to questions and answers now. It looks like um, the first one is probably, probably best answered by Dan and um, Ryan, but it's the question, could the Orbs software eventually be applied to smartphones, uh, especially phones with high quality cameras? Yeah, I can take that one. It's a great question and we get it a lot. Of course, everything in our lives would be easier if we didn't need something as fancy uh, as the orb to do this. Unfortunately, we specifically made the orb because we couldn't find a way to do it using smartphones, including those with nice cameras, even if the optical equipment was the same as, as an orb, which is not true of any phone, you still have an issue related to security and trust. So if you imagine that the orb is taking all these images, generating an iris code, and then only submitting the iris code with some other metadata, but not the images themselves, then there's a, a trust component. The, the protocol is basically expecting that this orb is processing the images correctly and not, for example, just spoofing the iris code itself. To have that same level of trust on a user's smartphone, the technology doesn't exist today. So we built a secure computing environment for the orb so the protocol could have the required level of trust but we don't see a way of doing that without that secure computing environment. Okay, I, that, I've had that question myself before, and that is about the best answer I've ever heard to that question. So actually that looks like, that looks like all the questions that we have for today. Yeah, I wanna thank uh, you know, uh, Dan and Ryan from TFH and Philip from the foundation for taking time to, to, talk, about, to talk about these important announcements today. And most importantly, I want to thank everyone that joined in uh, Twitter space today for listening and uh, continuing to, you know, to contribute to the project in any way that you do just by following along, um, by interacting with us on social media, or if you happen to be involved in uh, maybe our grant program or something, we just want to thank you all for your, your involvement and, and contributing any way that you do. Um, so thanks. And we'll talk to you soon.